European uh, nations have got together on the Epica ice cores and they are drilling even deeper into the Antarctic ice cap. What does this tell us? Well, from the study of these little stripes, the gas bubbles contained in those stripes, we can tell what the temperature was and what the CO2 level was, and indeed other gases in times gone by. What you see here is data which, when it was first published nearly 20 years ago now, caused a, a sensation. It showed for the first time the alternate warming and cooling of our planet. Here over 400,000 years on new measurements, almost one and a half million years have been charted. And these oscillations are now well understood. A Russian called Milankovitch said, ah, this is because the Earth moves further away from the Sun at times. It wobbles on its axis. Its axis is not even vertical. And Milankovitch explained, at a stroke, the reason for the ice ages that we know from the geological record that our geologists have told us about for generations. But the question for us today, and the question for you younger generation particularly, is have we departed from this cyclicity? The previous now million years had seen the CO2 levels never rising above 300 parts per million. All of a sudden, since the Industrial Revolution, they've gone off scale. The ice, this is a measurement uh, from, again, from NOAA in the United States, from satellites. Two and a half million cubic miles of ice have disappeared from glaciers in the last half century. If you melt a glacier, sea levels rise. We can now measure sea levels from satellites. These are scientific facts. Their interpretations are what is the challenge. And the temperature that we can measure and have been measured for the last one and a half centuries is now showing with a degree of precision the gradual warming of our planet, although scientists must admit to uncertainty and a flattening in this behavior in recent decades. Those the facts, and not even the typical sunspot cycle of activity can explain this gradual surface warming. The real questions, however, do not excite a unanimous consensus. Instead, they excite controversy. You will gather from some of the things I'm saying, having just come back from Antarctica, and by the way, I'm going to the Danum uh, Valley Rainforest to look at the research project in a few days' time. I couldn't resist the opportunity while I was here in Kuala Lumpur. Three years ago, three and a half years ago, I was trekking with our son to Everest Base Camp. And I took this picture of a lovely mountain in the Himalaya called Amadablan, which is Nepali for Mother's Little Jewel Box. It's a very beautiful mountain. It's clad in glaciers. That very same month, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published its fourth assessment report and buried deep, deep in over 1,000 pages of careful scientific appraisal was this statement, a now notorious statement that the Himalayan glaciers perhaps would melt by 2035. I saw Amadablan and the Everest group Lotse, Nupse, Everest itself clad in glaciers. I found this hard to believe and indeed this statement lay like a ticking bomb for almost two years until the end of 2009 when, as you know, in Malaysia and indeed all over the planet, all of a sudden, human beings who were not scientists began to question the predictions being made by scientists and indeed governments the world over raised question marks with their own chief scientific advisors and their scientific academies. Was this warning that was being given by climate scientists true or was it false? This caused sufficient concern at the United Nations that the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and the Chairman of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Rajendra Pachari, commissioned the Inter Academies Council, of which your Academy and the Royal Society are affiliated, to put together a study with the brief on the right, which was for us to advise the United Nations as to whether the evidence for climate change as presented by the IPCC was correct and accurate and their procedures and processes were capable of being audited independently and found correct. This happily 
uh, had one consequence, which is it brought Dr. Zachary and I together. The first time we had met, we sat next to each other by chance at our first meeting in Amsterdam and began what has already served, I may blossom into a warm friendship, but it's a huge pleasure to be here with you today. Our report was presented um, at the end of August at the United Nations. We looked very carefully at this now infamous statement. We delve deep into the records which are precise and well kept by the IPCC to find out how such an error could have been made. And indeed there are references which you probably won't be able to read. The bottom one from the Indian government no less says this is a very drastic conclusion. Should have supporting evidence or should be deleted. A referee from the University of Newcastle in the United Kingdom, which uh, my kind introducer studied at. <laughs> there, sorry. Um, this uh, scientist said, maybe the, the eastern Himalaya is melting, but in the western Himalaya and the Karakoram, glaciers are accreting. Are you sure? Despite all these references, the mistake went ahead and it damaged the integrity of climate science and the willingness of governments and the peoples the world over to trust what climate science was telling them. This is a very serious consequence which we addressed. I won't take you through the conclusions, but what I will say is that our main conclusion was that in 90,000 referee comments which had contributed to this assessment, we found only a tiny handful of errors. And as scientists ourselves, therefore, we were able to report to the United Nations and to its member governments that substantially the findings appeared to us to stand and to be supportable and to be correct, but that the procedures and the governance and the processes of the IPCC needed urgent reform, and that was indeed our message. Now this is where science and government and diplomacy become entangled. But the stakes here are extremely high. My colleagues on the left and Ban Ki-moon and uh, Rajendra Pachari on the right, I was the one holding the camera. That's why I'm not in the photograph. <laughs> so I would say that in this particular grand challenge, the problems are clearly vast, but there are some doubts which remain. How firm is the scientific consensus? Nations and diplomats the world over have to get to know their scientists better to be able to calibrate what we are saying. And we, the scientists, have to get to know you better so that there is a mutual understanding. So that when you ask us, is it black or white, if our answer is it's grey, but it's dark grey, that do you understand what we are saying? This is a dialogue which we cannot dispense with, which we absolutely need and require. And it is the onus on us as scientists, as much as on you as diplomats, that requires that we do this. Equally importantly, what is the extent of the public consensus? I'm coming back to that in a minute. What investments will be necessary? I want to turn to economics in a moment. What will be the benefit of mitigation. We talk about the threats and the costs of mitigation. What might be the benefits? And do these benefits outweigh the costs or are they weighed under by the costs? A few issues now that pick up what uh, the comments from my distinguished colleagues uh, were hinting at a little bit earlier. This is IPCC data again. It just shows the carbon budget of the planet, if you like. I want to look briefly at energy supply. I turned immediately to the US Department of Energy, led of course by a scientist, a Nobel Prize winner no less, Steve Chu, delightful man. And I found the US Energy Information uh, Administration. These two statements and two maps tell a very deep and fundamental story. At the top, a reminder that one third of the world's liquid fuel resources come from this group of nations in North Africa and the Middle East. And on the bottom, that Japan is the th world's third largest nuclear power. You don't need me to tell you that those nations in North Africa and the Middle East and the Gulf region are going through a time of some distress and some turmoil at the moment. So rather than reading the website, we are looking at our newsreels and seeing the images of Libya, 
and of the awful tragedy that's befallen Fukushima Power Station. This, to me, I think there's a Chinese saying that one picture is worth 1,000 words. This sums up the dilemma for humanity at the moment. Our sources of petroleum are in turmoil and the reliability of nuclear energy is now being questioned as never before. And my colleagues have already asked this question, what now for nuclear energy after Fukushima? Of course, there are safer solutions. Technology advances continuously. We must never, ever forget that. Fukushima is built on technology designed state-of-the-art 40 years ago. I know that the Malaysian government is currently contemplating the Westinghouse design as one possible option for your nuclear power station and that this Westinghouse design, of course, in the four decades since Fukushima was designed, uh, addresses many of these risks. But the big question I'd ask is, will the public now accept government's assessment of this risk? This is a very difficult science diplomacy question indeed. If they won't accept that risk, what do they think of some older risks which we live with, particularly those of us in China on a daily basis? We burn hydrocarbon fuels. Since I was an undergraduate half a century ago, we've been talking about taking the CO2 from our hydrocarbon fuels and pumping it back underground. Carbon capture and storage, CCS, carbon sequestration. Why are we just talking about it five decades later? Nobody other than a pilot experiment in Norway and the experiment uh, being conducted by Bechtel in the United States has made any progress on this question whatsoever. Meanwhile, we pump out gigatons of CO2. What about sustainable fuels? In Malaysia, you are intimately concerned with the growth of oil palm, which currently underpins many of the food products we take for granted in Europe, in North America, and of course throughout Asia. But sustainable fuels to replace gasoline-based products is a very serious proposition. Again, another report from my colleagues of the Royal Society, published in 2008. A long report, but it's summarized in this graph for me. Economics is something which determines everything about our daily lives as human beings. So the vertical axis is the percentage of carbon dioxide saved by various other non-petroleum sources of fuel. But the horizontal axis tells us the story of how much it will cost to put those technologies into operation. At the top, you can see that renewable hydrogen has huge attractions, but the technological challenges are enormous. But what we often think about as biofuels in America from wheat and from rapeseed are costs to put that fuel into our motor car tank which are unsustainable. So science lives always with the constraint that it may discover many things, but their application will ultimately be determined by economics. And you as diplomats and as members of government will realize also, particularly and potentially in election year, that economics determines the outcomes politically. There are other consequences. This is actually the Amazon Basin. But it could equally be a picture of where I should be visiting in a few days' time. When we take the natural habitat on our planet, when we change it, there are often beneficial changes, but there are consequences. And these consequences represent a very difficult balancing act, where science is an essential ingredient in the diplomacy between nations when we discuss these consequences. Renewables, therefore, attract huge attention. The United Kingdom is a very windy place, as those of you who have studied there know well. It rains a lot, it's cold. Um, not like this wonderful weather we're having here in Kuala Lumpur this week. So we are making a big bet on offshore wind farms. This is an onshore one. Um, there are questions, however, 